Buddha finds his enlightenment under a tree. It's not fluke that that's the case. That's his natural environment. And he's sitting in the lotus here. The lotus opens up. It's th this thing that springs up from the depths. And he sits there illuminated the same way. He's got a halo that's the sun that stands for higher consciousness. And he's, he's transcended by accepting the fact that life is suffering. He's transcended the limitations that are part of mortality. You see that symbol there? That swastika, you see it there? It's reversed. The Nazis reversed it. Well, think about that. I mean, they weren't stupid. Their, symbolism, their symbols had meaning, is what the swastika were represented, was what this represents reversed. Well, that's a very bad idea. This is the thing that this, this idea is what enables people to transcend their suffering. And Buddha said, well, don't, don't be too attached to things. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean deny the world. It might mean deny the world if you're too in love with the material, like with material well-being, let's say, then your pathway to transcendence and meaning might be to abandon that because it's, it's constraining you. It's making you less than you could be. But the, the fundamental lesson, the more fundamental lesson that's underneath that is don't let what you are stop you from being what you could be. Right. And so then the question is, well, what do you identify with? Do you identify with what you are? Then you're a tyrant. Do you identify with, with chaos? Because that's the opposite of order, say. Then you're nihilistic. Well, you don't identify with either of those. You, you know that they're both necessary. You know that you have to live with both of them. But you, would, you identify with the capacity to continually transcend what you are. And then you seek out error. That's what humility is. It's like, I'm error-ridden. It's like, so I want to see. I want to put myself in a situation where I can discover one of my errors. Hopefully not in a way that's going to knock me completely out of the game, right? I, I, want, to, I want to seek out a challenge. I want to find out where my limits are. I want to find out where there's not enough of me yet. And I want to do that in a way that's engaging. Because, you know, you can wear yourself out fighting dragons, obviously. You can exhaust yourself completely, and that's not helpful. You know, one, one of the things I learned, for example, when I was coaching, when I was coaching lawyers, who these were people who had very high-end careers, and so they had an infinite workload, no matter how much they worked, flat out, there was always way more work that they should do. It's a very difficult thing to learn to manage. And so they were exhausting themselves, and, and I said, well, you know, you have to work less per day. It's like, well, <laughs> no, that's not happening. I, I can't do that. And so... Well, the, what I learned over time was, okay, so this is what you have to do. Every three months you have to block off four days and go have a vacation. And you have to plan that in advance so it's in your calendar so that your secretary doesn't book your time. And then you need that because you have to recuperate enough so that you can work as hard as you're going to work. And of course they were nervous about that. And I said, well look, we can, we can calibrate this. Let's keep track of your billable hours over the next year and see if they increase or decrease. Because I bet you if you take more time off you'll actually have more billable hours. You'll actually have your cake and eat it too. You'll get to have a vacation and you'll be more productive. And that inevitably that was what happened. And so that's a matter of calibrating the game properly, right? You want to play a game that you can play today, but also one that you can play next week and next month. We're not talking about, you know, your your career this week. We're talking about you having a career that lasts 30 years, that doesn't kill you, that doesn't make you hate yourself or the job, that doesn't make you bitter, that doesn't wear you to a frazzle. So we, it has to be optimized. And so I think that you can, in fact, decide to take on the load that's optimally meaningful if you want, and then you get to have your cake and eat it too. You're on the pathway to continual incremental improvement. You only have to burn off a feather at a time instead of having the whole bloody thing burst into flames. But it's a, constant, it's a constant source of renewal. And there's an idea that to be renewed, you have to drink the water of life, right? That, that, that's an old mythological idea. And what's the water? The water of life, chaos is water. water. Water is chaos. Water is what washes away too much order. And to stay continually, let's say, uh, um, refreshed by the water of life is to take on exactly the right amount of chaos to make sure that your garden is properly nourished. And I think meaning is actually the marker of that. And, and as I said, you know that I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself either naive or a particularly optimistic person. I don't think I'm either of those. But this is an, actually an idea 
This is one of the only ideas that I've ever found that I really believe to be rock solid. I actually think that it's true. And, and it's very optimistic because it says you can use your sense of meaning to calibrate your progress through life. It, but, but there's rules. You have to aim at the highest possible good that you can conceive. Now, and, and that's subject to update, because what the hell do you know? But you know, start by aiming at the star you can see, rather than the dimmer one that you can't yet perceive. And then you decide that you're going to do that honestly, right? There's that, that's a big decision. So uh, the first decision, I think, in some sense, is a decision of love. You're going to decide that being is worthwhile and that you're going to work for its betterment. And that's a decision that's based on love. And the second decision is based on truth. Having made that decision, you're going to play a straight game. Having made those two decisions, I think that you can allow your sense of meaning to calibrate your pathway. And then what's so interesting is that you hit a state that's as close to paradisal as you're going to hit right away because being engaged like that, it's better to be engaged in the solution of a complex problem than not to have a problem at all. And that's, that's no different than saying it's better for there to be being than non-being because being is a problem. And so, if you want to have no problems, then you have no being. And, and you could say, well, being is so miserable that maybe that's the route we should take. And fair enough, but maybe you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have the damn problem. It can be a problem worth solving, and you can be so engaged in solving the problem that it justifies the fact that the problem exists. And then you get, then you get, to, have, you get to have the problem and the solution at the same time. And maybe that's better than not having the problem at all. And I believe that, because one of the things I have seen, and I've seen this so interesting, been so interesting when I've been lecturing to people, especially more recently, and, and this is also manifested on you, my, itself on YouTube, I'm talking to people a lot about responsibility, and it's young men in particular that seem to be responding to that. And I think that's partly because I think that young women, in some sense, have their responsibility map already laid out for them. It's, it's also less voluntary, in some sense, for women, because they have more complicated problems to solve in the first part of their life, right? They, because they have to get the family problem solved. But whatever. I've been talking very, in a very delineated manner about responsibility which is a strange thing to sell to people, but responsibility is what gives your life meaning. And so then you might say, well, then take on ultimate responsibility. And what happens? You have an ultimately meaningful life. And then you might say, well, if your life is ultimately meaningful, it doesn't matter if it's punctuated by tragedy or even predicated on tragedy. It's worth it. And I think that's true. And it, everything I've seen indicates to me that's true. Every time I get my clients to take on more responsibility, you know, it, and it isn't an injunction. You're a bad person, you should take on responsibility. It has nothing to do with that. You can define the damn responsibility. It isn't something that, that someone else should impose on you. It's not a matter of doing what you should do in some abstract manner. It's, it's not that. It's the choice of what game you're going to play. And you know, you can play the game of the seeker, I would say, and if you play that game, then everyone wins. And it's the best game you can play. And so, the, the, the answer, in some sense, to the tragedy of life, to the catastrophe of life, to the fall, is to adopt the responsibility of mortality that goes along with that, and to play that game maximally. And paradoxically, it's in the willingness to do that, that the solution emerges.